Jesus was teaching in the temple. And the chief priests had had enough. They sent officers to arrest him. And sometime later, the officers came back. And they said, where is he? And all they could say in defense was, no man ever spoke like this man. So here we are beginning a study in the Gospel of John in which this incident is recorded. We're going to start at the beginning, work all the way through to the end. And as we do, we're going to hear the words of Jesus. We're also going to hear the words of his disciple John, who wrote this gospel. And you think, what a privilege to be able to look at things that kings and prophets longed to look into and couldn't. So we're going to have an introduction today, and next week we'll start with chapter 1. When you start talking about introduction, you have to say, what is it? And the answer is, it's not an epistle. It's not, you know, a, a work of prophecy as such. It's a gospel. It's one of four that we have in the New Testament. And I'm sure you've noticed that the other three are very similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Can you say synoptic? Synoptic. I knew you could. <laughs> Synoptic is a big technical word that means giving the same view. And you have these three authors following roughly the same organization, giving similar material about Jesus, and in some cases almost word for word. What else we notice about these three is that each author has his own special vocabulary and points of style. Each of them will add certain things to the story that the others don't. So they remain distinct authors with their own particular emphases. They are not merely copyists of one another. But when you get to John, it's different. It is an independent witness to Jesus Christ. They've estimated that only about 8 to 9 percent of what John says is paralleled in any of the three. There's very little contact with the Synoptic Gospels. And even then, what common incidents they have are also from a different standpoint. For example, when Jesus went into the temple and cleared the money changers out. That's something found in all four Gospels. But when you get to John, he has it near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, whereas the other three authors put it at the end. And the details are so different that they've had to conclude there had to have been two separate instances when Jesus took a whip of cords and drove those money changers out. In the synoptics, we see Jesus teaching and with parables. And he's also speaking in short, pithy statements. But in John, you have longer discourses with individuals and with groups. And yet what you have in all four Gospels is the same Jesus. He's the same in all four accounts. In John, you might become accustomed to Jesus uh, as the divine Son of God, talking about his relationship to the Father. Like in chapter 5 here, it says, he says, not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. 
He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And there's a lot of statements like that in John. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? But then you listen to this statement out of Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now you could have put that in John, and nobody would have blinked. And yet it's, in Matthew. And that shows that really in all four Gospels, it's still dealing with the same Jesus. And actually, we need all four Gospels to get a complete picture of Jesus. For example, Matthew, Mark, and John, uh, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They look at Jesus' ministry from one perspective, and if you add up the time that it looks to cover, you could come to the conclusion that Jesus' ministry took about a year, more or less, and then he goes up to Jerusalem and he's suddenly crucified within a week. But what John shows is that Jesus, his ministry lasted for about a little over three years. And they time it because John keeps referring to feasts and the Passovers. They've counted three of them and possibly a fourth. So they know that Jesus' ministry was longer. And he was often in Jerusalem. That's what we get the most in John. And that's where he came into real conflict with the religious leaders. All the synoptic gospels tell us that Peter was in the court of the high priest when he denied Jesus three times. But only John's gospel shows us how he got there in the first place. Turns out that the unnamed disciple was known to the high priest. He was able to talk to the servant girl to get Peter in. That's the only way Peter could have got in. And we only get that detail in John. Another example is that all the synoptic gospels show that the chief priests were looking for testimony so that they could condemn Jesus, but they couldn't find any. And then lastly, they found two people who said, he said, I'm able to destroy the temple and in three days raise it up. And it says not even then did their testimony agree. This also comes up later on when Jesus is being crucified. That people are saying, oh yeah, you said you could destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. Well, ha ha ha. And it's even repeated in Acts chapter 6 when Stephen is being accused of blasphemy. And yet, this Jesus teaching about destroy the temple and in three days I'll raise it up is found not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Acts. It's found in John chapter 2. That's the only place it's even told about. So, John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And yet, we need all four Gospels to see that complete picture about Jesus. And they all show us the same Jesus. Another question when you think about introductions is, who wrote the Gospel of John? It's technically called the go Gospel according to John. It's the same Gospel, but it's according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke. So, who is the author? And the answer is, it doesn't say. And in fact, none of the Gospels say who wrote them. So, how do we know? The answer is, one, historical tradition, and two, internal evidence in the Gospel. Now, in the Gospel, you can look at the circumstantial evidence, and it's really interesting. Because the author tells us who he is in John 
chapter 21, very near the end, and I'm going to read it to you. It says in verse 20, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his bosom at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who was testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So, the disciple whom Jesus loved wrote the gospel. Now, we know that this disciple is one of the apostles because only the apostles were in the upper room with Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. And he was that disciple who was kind of leaning back on Jesus as they were eating. The reason for that is they weren't sitting in chairs, but it was a kind of a Roman method of eating around a U-shaped table, and everybody's sort of leaning on one side, and so they're kind of lounging around. And you'd, you'd be able to lean back on people, and this guy was right next to Jesus. So he could kind of lean back, and when Peter's saying, go oh, ask him who's going to betray him, then he could just lean back and say, Lord, who is it? And, you know, not have it like, who's going to betray you, Jesus? Oh, well, it's that guy right over there. It was a little more subtle than that. So, that's the disciple. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's all he's referred to as. Now, what's interesting about this is that the fellow who wrote the Gospel of John is very meticulous about names. In fact, apostles that hardly show up in the synoptic gospels, and you know what I'm talking about now because we've gone over the word synoptic. You're going to walk out of here saying, synoptic, what do you think about that? And you can impress your family and your friends. So in the synoptic gospels, you hardly ever hear of the other disciples. They'll come up in some of the lists. But in John, you've got Philip speaking. You've got Nathaniel, Thomas. He's always referred to Thomas, also called Didymus. And you've got the distinction made between Judas Iscariot and Judas, parentheses, not Iscariot. John is, well, the author who's buried in Grant's tomb. <laughs> the author is very meticulous about names, but when it comes to this particular disciple, he never names him. He only calls him the disciple whom Jesus loved. Another thing that people have noticed about the Gospel of John is that James, John's brother, is never mentioned. This is unusual because then in all the other Gospels, there's an inner circle of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. You know, Jesus had a nickname for James and John. He called them the Sons of Thunder. And that must have been because they were so pleasant. <laughs> there's one example, you know, when the Samaritan village says, we don't want you coming in here. And they come back to Jesus and say, okay, Shall we call down fire from heaven? And Jesus says, no. <laughs> kind of shuts him down real quick. And some people think that Jesus really just wanted to keep Peter, James, and John on a very short leash. So he says, I want you right here. I don't want you over there. I want you right here. Keep an eye on them. Because, you know, Peter did take the sword and cut off the ear. It's like, okay, stop that. Don't take them. Watch, I'm going to heal his ear just like that. See, everything's cool. <laughs> so, 
they're there in the other three Gospels, but James and John are never mentioned in the Gospel of John with one exception. That's in chapter 21 when they're called the sons of Zebedee. Still no names. And this is remarkable when the author is so meticulous about who's talking, details, topographical details. It goes on and on and on. And yet, two guys never mentioned. So, here are two possibilities in the apostolic circle, James or John. And they've decided it couldn't have been James because he was the first of the apostles to be martyred at around the year 44. So that leaves John to be the author. And we're going to see this come out in various aspects in the gospel. Along with that, we also have the external witness of early church writers who are unanimous in saying that John wrote the gospel. That is, there's the church writer Irenaeus. He's around the year 185 AD. And he was the disciple of Polycarp. How do you name a guy Polycarp? <laughs> Polycarp was a disciple directly of John, knew him. And so he was able to tell Irenaeus, yep, John wrote the gospel. And you have a unanimous decision among all the church writers that it was John that wrote this. So although it is not directly stated, we can work out that John was the author of this gospel. When and where did he write it? Well, I have a stack of commentaries about this big. And they kind of wrestle around with this. And it's interesting that there's nothing in the gospel here that could say it wasn't written, let's say, before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. It could have been written in the year 60. It's so independent of the other gospels that it doesn't really depend on them, if they existed or not, when he wrote it. So as early as the year 60, but as late as the year 90, because of the other epistles that John wrote and the Revelation. He wrote that around the year 95 to 96. And the gospel came first. So, anywhere from the year 60 to the year 90 is when this was written. So, well within the first century. And tradition also says that John wrote this in Ephesus. And that would be southwestern modern-day Turkey. More than that, I cannot tell because I'm not a propeller head. <laughs> and I read these commentaries and I go, wow, you went on for 15 pages to say you're not sure. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> so, believe me, you don't have to worry about stuff like that. But, what's it about? And again, it's different. It has a prologue in the first chapter, which is completely unique to all the Gospels. This Gospel goes back before creation, in eternity. We're shown the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word is God. Before anything was created, there is this Word. And as we will see when we come to the time, word is a concept that just talks about meaning, definition. And the scripture says there is a person who can explain who God is. And that person is referred to as the word. Also, in verse 14 of chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. So John connects up this 
divine figure with a concrete historic figure, Jesus Christ. And then after that, the scene switches to the testimony of John the Baptist, who says, first of all, I'm not the Christ, and second of all, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So then after that, it switches to the disciples, the first disciples who saw John point to Jesus and go up to him and say, Rabbi, where are you living? Which is kind of a rabbi-teacher sort of expression for, can we be your disciples? And Jesus says, yes. And right after that, we see the disciples run out and grab more disciples. They grab their brothers and say, you got to see this guy. So, then we see what Jesus did and what he said in his public ministry. And it's organized in groups of seven. That is, there are seven major miraculous signs pointed out in the gospel. Turning water into wine in the city of Cana in chapter 2. Healing a nobleman's son also in Cana, that's chapter 4. Healing the man who was ill for 38 years in Jerusalem, chapter 5. Feeding the 5,000 at the Sea of Tiberias, or otherwise known as the Sea of Galilee, that's chapter 6. Healing the man born blind in Jerusalem, that's chapter 9. Raising Lazarus from the dead after being dead for four days in Bethany beyond the Jordan, that's chapter 11. And the last one is rising from the dead in Jerusalem, chapter 20. Then there are seven discourses, extended conversations with individuals or groups. And this is different, again, from the synoptic gospels where Jesus teaches, but mostly in parables, and he has sayings, but they're short and they're pithy and they're not like these extended discussions that we only have here. The first is Nicodemus at the Passover in Jerusalem chapter 3. The second is the woman at the well in Sychar in Samaria, that's chapter 4, with the Jews in the temple chapter 5, this is during the Feast of Booths. The fourth is with the Jews around Capernaum and in the synagogue chapter 6 with the Jews at the temple during the feast in Jerusalem chapter 7, again at the temple in chapter 8, and again at the temple in chapter 10. After that, John gives the only detailed explanation of what happened in the upper room on the night that Jesus was betrayed. It's detailed, but then it's different because it's the only gospel that has no mention of Jesus instituting communion. No mention of saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Completely independent. Then John shows us the trial and crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection. Chapter 21 is an epilogue, a concluding section where Jesus restores Peter after a tough night of no fishing and Peter wants to pack it in as the disciple. And Jesus doesn't let him do that. So there's kind of the structure of the Gospel of John. And you ask, okay, what's it all for? What is the purpose of the Gospel of John? Well, John writes at the very end in chapter 20, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of this gospel and all the gospels, is to look at Jesus, to hear Jesus. This is definitely a gospel, and it gives testimony to the truth about Jesus. Truth is more than theological 
proposals, abstract reasoning. The Gospel of John says that truth is a person. And we are brought face to face with a person who says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Truth is a person. And in John 17, Jesus says that eternal life is knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. A lot of people's idea about eternal life is just life that goes on and on and on and you don't have Netflix. You don't have anything except a harp. <laughs> and there you are, sitting on a cloud going boom and going, wow, I suppose it's worth it. <laughs> the Bible has nothing like that. Eternal life is to know God. And not only that, the only true God. Lots of gods out there. Lots of things claiming to be the truth. But this is something that is so exclusive, intolerable, it totally excludes everybody else. Jesus says, this is eternal life, to know you, the one true living God, and Jesus Christ. That would be unbelievable in anybody else's mouth to put themselves on the same level as God. And yet, it's absolutely necessary that Jesus do that because, again, it's not possible to know God except through Jesus. And we'll look at chapter 1, verse 14, where John actually says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And that word for declare is the word we get the English word exegete, which is not a word you use very often. <laughs> Honey, where's the exegete? It's where you left it. No. <laughs> Exegete is what I work on every week. And it means to explain, to lay it out in detail what something means. And I will stand up here and take a word and explain what the word means and then apply it to the situation and make it so everybody goes, well, duh, of course that's what it means. If I do my job right. Well, Jesus is the one who takes everything that is God and lays it out so everybody can look at it and say, that's who God is. And God should look like Jesus. And if he doesn't, you're in trouble. You don't have God. So, this is eternal life, to know Jesus. And through Jesus, knowing the only true living God. So, we are going to be listening to Jesus speak. No man ever spoke like that man. And it's going to be encouraging because the more you know Jesus, the more you are laying hold of eternal life. It's directly related if you don't know Jesus very well, your hold on eternal life is going to be tenuous. But the more you know him, the more you take it to yourself, and it is yours, and nobody can take it away from you. So, how necessary. Now, it's also going to build the faith of others, just the way it's going to build your faith. And so, 
you can do like what the early disciples did. They met Jesus and they heard him and they saw him and they ran away. Got their brothers, got their friends. Andrew says to Simon Peter, his brother, he says, you've got to see this guy. And Philip runs off and gets his friend Nathaniel. He says, we found him whom Moses and the prophets wrote of, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel looks at him and goes, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. You check it out. And of course, Nathaniel shows up and says, Hi. <laughs> and Jesus goes, Oh, yeah. An Israelite without, he has no guile in him whatsoever. He says, How do you know me? He says, Oh, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> You're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, you know, if Nathaniel had just sat on his one spot and thought about all the dips that ever came out of <laughs> Nazareth and said, you know what, they're all alike. They're all a bunch of pinheads. I haven't got time for one more. He never would have got it. But Philip says, you moron, come and see. Okay, 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 quit poking me. All right, hi. Then he gets his mind blown. See, this will do this for other people. You think, oh, this is just one more religious thing to do, is it? Oh my gosh. I feel just as awkward as if, you know, you were about to step into a strip club, you know, this is weird. And yet, all you got to say is, hey, come and listen. Come and see. It's really one of the easiest ways to witness to people. Just say, come on and check it out one time. Because you never know, they might do that. So it's going to build everybody's faith. And this is going to be a good study, don't you think? I think so too. So why don't we pray and ask God to bless this. Thank you. Heavenly Father, that we have all these things written down for us. And we get to hear the voice of God. What a privilege to see, to hear, to know. And we ask you to teach us, to declare to us that we might really lay hold of these things. And we pray for our families, our friends, people we run into. We pray that you would draw many people to Jesus and help us to invite them. To say, listen, you've got to hear this stuff. You've got to see it. Because no man ever spoke the way you spoke through Jesus. We commit now our time to you and trust that you're going to do a great work as your word goes forth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost But now I'm found I was blind But now I see